host with the Clean Energy Solutions Center, and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Solutions Center in partnership with MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Today's webinar is focused on the Boston Community Energy Study. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over the telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option, and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and the audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having any technical difficulties with the webinar, you may connect to the GoToWebinars Help Desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as our speakers present. Also, the audio recording and presentations will be posted to the Solution Tra Center training page within a few days of the broadcast and will be added to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note to mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentation from our guest panelist, Eric Morgan. Who, is, who has joined us to discuss the Boston Citywide Energy Study. Before we jump into the presentation, I'll provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Then following Eric's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session where Eric will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, we'll be, you will be automatically prompted to fill out a brief survey as well. So thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond. The Solutions Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy, energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. 24 countries and the European Commission are members of covering 90% of the clean energy investment and 75% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which focuses on helping the government policy makers design and adopt policies and programs and support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through the support in crafting and implementing policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponded by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States with in-kind support from the government of Mexico. The Solutions Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to government and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with de development agencies and regional and global organizations to deliver support, and an online library containing over 5,500 clean energy policy-related publications, tools, videos, and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from government and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with private sectors, NGOs, and civil society. The Solution Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across a suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above include research organizations like IRENA and the IEA and programs like SE for All and a regional focused entity such as ECOWAS, Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. A marquee feature of the Solutions Center provides is a no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with more than 60 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of energy resilience, we are pleased to have Michael Milton Wu, Principal of Converge Strategies, serving as one of our experts. If you have a need for policy assistance in energy resilience or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, 
This assistance is, free, is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online format, cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Now I'd like to provide a brief introduction for today's panelists. Eric Morgan is a member of the technical staff in the Energy Systems Group at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. At Lincoln Laboratory, Eric works on adding renewable energy and energy storage to tactical DOD microgrids and has researched microgrid development for the city of Boston. And with, those int with this introduction, I'd like to welcome Eric to the webinar. Eric? Hello. Thank you. Um, should I just start going? Absolutely. We look forward to it. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, for being here today. Um, so, a couple uh, things to start off with. I'll be talking about the Boston Community Energy Study today, also known as the Citywide Energy Study. Um, I'm at Lincoln Laboratory right now in Lexington, Massachusetts. Lincoln Laboratory is a federally funded R&D center, but it's funded through the Department of Defense. So we do work for national security technology and support of national security. So <clears throat> we see microgrids and, and grid resiliency as being a piece of, uh, of national security. And certainly with problems like Hurricane Harvey, uh, you know, most recently in, in Irma, um, you know, and, and seeing the devastation that occurred after that, how do we bring those communities back online more quickly? And uh, how do we make sure that people are safe after those events happen? And so part of that is, uh, I'll talk about today um, in terms of the energy piece. So can everyone see my slides? Okay. Eric, yeah, we can, the presentation looks great. Okay, good. All right, so let me just start off with the world urban population and, and electricity use. So back in 1980s, you know, the three major countries in terms of population were India, China, and, and the United States. Everyone, you know, each, each of them had about, you know, 150 million to 200 million people in urban centers. Uh, of those three, the United States was, was uh, using a lot of electricity compared to India and China. And so as we advance by, by decade here, 1990, 2000, 2001, what you see is that people are moving into cities, especially in India and China, and in, in those regions, people are using a lot more electricity than they did. In the United States, um, you know, we're up to about 250 million people in urban centers, and, you know, we're still using about, um, I think that's 10,000 um, kilowatt hours per person per year. So, um, that that suggests that you have concentrated people using a lot of electricity, right? And so what you want to do is make sure that those people that are concentrated in, in those certain areas um, can be supported by the infrastructure. Um, but what ends up happening is, at least in the United States, this is now billion dollar disasters, and there's a couple more that, that just got appended to this for 2017. Uh, this goes through 2014. Um, you end up with people in large urban centers that get hit with huge storms, whether that's uh, cyclones or, or some other severe storm. Uh, and then the amount of money that gets spent um, to compensate for these, these huge events uh, starts to get larger and larger, right? So um, on the right-hand side is the CPI adjusted losses in terms of billions of dollars. And there's certain spikes. There's a spike for uh, Hurricane Katrina. There's gonna be another one for Harvey. There was one in 2012. Um, but th these trends are suggesting that as people kind of concentrate, you end up with, with very costly problems. Uh, so one way to try to mitigate some of that is what we call microgrids. And, and microgrids are, I can read the definition for you here, but it's essentially uh, a smaller version of what we consider the grid, right? So in, in where I am in New England, we have uh, a grid that consists of all of the New England states and we can export power to um, Canada uh, and bring it in from Canada and also to New York. Uh, but a microgrid is a much smaller version of that, you know, on the say 10 to 100 megawatt scale rather than the gigawatt scale. And so you could add things like renewables, cogeneration, electric vehicle storage, and then interconnect with the utility to create a small system 
uh, of, of electrical power distribution. And so when you do that, you can increase the security, the stability, and the resilience in the face of outages. Um, and it's actually a fairly cost-effective way to, to, uh, to produce power. And it's sustainable because you can incorporate renewables into it. So uh, that's what a microgrid is, but there's certainly challenges that we have that, uh, that are impeding the progress of microgrids on the larger grid right now. How do you interconnect with the grid? How do you make sure that the frequency on the microgrid is the same as the macro grid when you go to close those, those breakers? Uh, and so there's certain research questions around that. In terms of what they're providing for resiliency, this is a picture of uh, Superstorm Sandy back in 2013. This is uh, Manhattan, and uh, that's Goldman Sachs that's on. They have a microgrid. So what we're trying to say here uh, you know, in terms of national security is we want to be Goldman Sachs. We want to be the, the building with the lights on when there's a huge disaster. Uh, in Superstorm Sandy, uh, there were several microgrids actually that were running 11 facilities, about 145 megawatts of power. Um, there's these included hospitals, places of refuge, municipal entities. Um, Princeton University uh, had one. They were on online after a couple of hiccups, but they, they came online. But what ended up happening in something like the 2003 blackout uh, was half of the New York City's hospital backup generators failed. And we see that in, in DOD installations as well, where DOD installations, um, a lot of the Army, Navy um, bases around, they'll have backup generation, but then when, when they lose power, they'll realize that their backup generators don't actually work because they haven't tested them in, in two years. They don't have fuel, they don't, they don't turn on, the mice chew the wires, something like that. So in a microgrid, the systems are always on, they're always engaged, you're always kind of making sure that they're, they're operational. So it's a different mindset than having just a, a, a backup generator. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about Boston today. So let me first brief what Boston is, for those of you that don't, don't know. So it's about 655,000 people in Boston itself, that's Boston proper. It's about triple that if you kind of go outside into the Beltway area, the 128. Uh, Boston itself covers about 50 square miles, has about 84,000 parcels of land or 92,000 buildings, some of which you see here. And that's actually getting, uh, you know, the buildings are getting taller and taller uh, and uh, seem to be growing in, in size and, and uh, population. So globally, what this means is that we're adding three Bostons per week uh, to cities. So that first chart I showed you where people are moving into cities. We have to compensate globally for three Bostons every week, which is a lot of people. So if we can solve the, uh, the microgrid challenge, then you know it'll help globally as well. Um, we did have a problem here in Boston. Um, some of the power went out because the substation failed. Uh, one of the, the Prudential Sutter went out. That's the one on, on the right side. And then the uh, John Hancock building stayed on. I believe they have some microgridding capability in there. So some of the citywide energy study objectives, we wanted to look at Boston and we wanted to figure out where the microgrids and distributed energy resources make some economic sense, uh, where they support critical loads, critical being hospitals or places of refuge. Uh, we wanted to serve vulnerable populations if, if possible. So vulnerable people would be elderly or poor uh, or you know, anything in between. We also wanted to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions so how do we uh, provide resiliency while reducing the carbon footprint? Um, and we want to be able to develop a generic approach that you can use not only in Boston, but New York City, Washington, D.C., you know, Tokyo, wherever it happens to be. Um, but in order to do that, we, we really needed to, to get one city done properly, right? Uh, some of that was talking to Boston and the government, the utilities, the stakeholders, and the public about what they were expecting. From, uh, from, I guess, the government or you know, federal government or local government in terms of um, adding resiliency. We also wanted to be able to figure out what we needed to, to uh, what kind of information we need for these large scale energy transitions, what kind of data we, we need. So I'll talk about the study approach that we had. I'll overview some of the building modeling that was done on, on MIT campus at the Sustainable Design Lab. And then I'll talk about some of uh, Boston's 
simulated energy use. I'll talk about what DIRCAM is. DIRCAM uh, is put out by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I will talk a little bit about what CHP means, uh, combined heat and power, and then some of the results that we had. So this is just a blueprint of, of the uh, entire study. The study itself took, on our end at Lincoln Lab, maybe two months, but there was a lot of work done by, by campus prior to that to get the building information correct. So let me just talk about Boston and the, the building stock that we have here. This is the vintages of the buildings. This is a map of Boston. So pre-1950 buildings, uh, that's in green. Um, and so you can see that's actually fairly old building stock. There's not a lot of new development in terms of uh, buildings. So 2010 to present, even though when you go to Boston, it feels like there's a lot of new buildings popping up. Um, relative to the number of buildings that we actually have in the entire city, there's actually not that many new ones. Um, so what we have is an old uh, building stock, which means that uh, the insulation isn't great on a lot of these places, the wiring's not great, and so there's heating and, and cooling issues uh, that we have to contend with. In terms of building types, this is a chart that shows you know, everything from churches all the way down to athletic facilities. Um, and it contains a, a lot of residential areas. So a lot of those green buildings that I showed in the, the previous chart here, a lot of those green ones are actually residences. So one to two story, three story uh, housing uh, in, in Boston itself. Uh, to orient you, the airport is the big uh, peach thing on the top right, that's Logan Airport. And then there's you know various uh, other specialized parcels of land here and there. But this is generally what we're looking at is old buildings that are primarily residential. So what, what the campus did was take a look at the, the, the energy information for, for certain buildings. This is another um, shot of a smaller area just to show you kind of what the resolution is. And the state house is in the middle there. Um, so what, did the, what was the modeling done on these buildings by campus? So what they really wanted to do was first understand the, the vintages of these, these buildings, but they needed to get GIS data for, for the entire city. So they could figure out you know, what the building property type was, how many stories it had, what year it was built, and what year it was renovated, et cetera. So they had an understanding of what the building actually physically was. Um, they needed to know things like how high it was above uh, sea level, what the structure type, what it was being used for. And that was all of the data that the city actually provided from Boston Redevelopment Authority, one of our partners on this project. The building geometry was then uh, was then added. So once they kind of knew how high it was and how many people were in it, and maybe something about the windows, they could start to, to add it into a 3D model of the entire city itself. And that was useful for shading and, and for uh, figuring out, you know, or orienting where the buildings are in, in the city. And from there, they can start to take some of the, the data that, um, that they work with in the architecture department, you know, shading, uh, building use, how many people are in the building, and generate physical models of what they think the, the energy use is going to be for each of these buildings. And there's about, like I said, 85,000 buildings. And so based on that, they came up with an hourly uh, simulated data set for every building. So now we have 8,760 hours for one year simulated for plug loads, cooling, heating, and hot water. And the energy is assumed to be the end use with not considering the efficiencies. So they're really trying to bring the city to life in terms of what is being done on the energy, uh, for the energy footprint of the city itself. So they, they were able to simulate all of that data. Uh, I'll give you a little sense of, of what that looks like terms of 8760 data. This is District Hall where I gave a talk. So I, I actually used District Hall's um, uh, energy uh, portfolio for, for the year. Plug loads are on the top there. Plug load is anything that you're actually plugging into a, a socket. Uh, so whether that's a computer or a television or a laptop or you know something like that. Um, cooling loads would be anything that's air conditioning. Uh, heating load obviously is when you're providing heat during the winter, uh, spring, and fall months, and then hot water, so you know shower loads, etc. And it's kind of robotic here. It's um, essentially 
the entire city is turning on and off their, their plug loads at the same time. Um, but eventually what they wanted to do with the data was kind of convoluted a little bit and, and add a little bit of noise to it. Um, but this is what we were working with at the time. So we, I showed you the state house. This is what the state house actually looks like. I've broken this into the different seasons uh, in terms of plug cooling, heating, and hot water. So um, if you look at the plug loads, they're fairly constant across the, 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 uh, the four seasons. Cooling loads, obviously summer and a little bit in spring. Heating loads are actually fairly interesting. There's much, much higher heating than there is anything else uh, in terms of the power needed for, for basically every building. So just be mindful that when I talk about energy use, we're, we're talking a lot about heating here too, not just electricity. So some of the study was based on um, some of the other work that was done in Kuwait. So the folks from, from campus, Christoph Reinhardt and his team um, actually tried to figure out what was happening in some of these buildings in Kuwait. And so they did a simulated, uh, what they thought was simulated um, or good simulated uh, energy use uh, intensity, but what they found when they actually went to to the buildings and walked through them is, is that their their models were wrong. They they were a little bit off, so they needed to to calibrate them, and so they were able to do that in Kuwait. What they we did not do that in Boston. We were not able to get um, actual you know data for electricity, heat, hot water, etc. So just be mindful as we move forward through this that the data that we have is simulated data based on our best guess but it's not actually calibrated like they did here in the, in the Kuwait study. Um, but there's actually, you know, there's a lot of information that, that campus was able to provide. So this is one of Christoph Reinhardt's projects uh, was looking at uh, photovoltaic potential in different cities. This is actually a really neat tool called MapDwell. Um, it's, I believe, uh, Google either took it over or, or made something very similar to it, but it sh essentially shows uh, what the uh, potential for PV is on any rooftop in Boston. This is also uh, showing you what the total electricity demand is in a, you know, on a typical day in Boston. So we have some of this data also is what, what the PV would look like. So based on kind of all of the data that we were given from, from uh, campus, Question is what what do we do with it? You know what what are we going to look at? And so let me just show you uh, downtown Boston here. This is to orient you a little bit. Uh, Mass. I guess you can't see my. There it is. Okay. This is Massachusetts General Hospital. It's actually one of the largest energy users in the uh, in the city. This is Faneuil Hall downtown. Um, I'm looking now at the energy intensity of the buildings in kilowatt hours per per square meter per month. Um, and so it goes from almost nothing, which is some of these vacant lots, to, to significant uh, energy use. And I'll, this is a movie. I'll try to, I think it's going to be a little bit jerky over the, uh, the webinar, but I'll, I'll, oops, I'll play, play a little bit here. This is January. That's February. So we still have pretty high uh, um, energy intensity. I uh, will keep moving through here. That's March, April. I'll stop it there. April it starts to come down. So April is one of these shoulder months where you don't really have heating and you don't have that much cooling yet. And so it's essentially mostly electricity that's, that's being used. So the, the entire city is actually at a low energy use level in April. Uh, that'll start to come back up as we move into the summer months. I'll move it into uh, May and June. June here, really starting to do the, the cooling. Uh, this is all electricity, but there's no heating right now. Uh, July, again, we're starting to move into cooling. This is September, October. October doesn't have any heating yet. Um, oh boy, sorry about that. Uh, if I can get my mouse back, I'll show you the end of the video. Um, but it's just, at the very end of the video, it's essentially the same as January where you've got almost all heating load uh, occurring in the city itself. So November and then December. So that's what we're contending with. Uh, in terms of the statistics for the city, on the left-hand side, we've got the building stock. That's the type of the building and the amount of floor area that we have. 
Uh, and then the energy data is, is the rest of it. So total energy, gas, electric, plug, heating, cooling, and hot water. So what we see here is that the residential is you know, over 90% of the buildings, but in terms of total energy, it's less than half. Uh, things like offices in blue represent under 10%, you know, 5% of the total buildings, but in terms of total energy, they're somewhere in the you know, 20% range, right? Uh, in terms of electric, they're using something like a third uh, of the entire uh, budget for the city. There's other interesting um, features here. The medical labs, uh, that is like the hospitals, for example, they represent almost none of the buildings in the entire city, very, very small number, maybe 10. But if you look at their floor area, they've got a significant amount of floor area. Their total energy use and their total cooling use is, is very, very high in, in terms of what the, the city is, is, um, is using. Um, and hot water, I should just note here that hotels have a lot of hot water usage on the very far right on the top there. Uh, in terms of the heat map for the city, this is hours per day on the x-axis and day of the year on the y-axis. This is just showing that in June, like I said, it's a shoulder month, so we're only using something like 250 megawatts of energy uh, or power uh, in the middle of the night. This is two o'clock in the morning on you know June 8th. Whereas you contrast that with by the time you get to January, you know January 23rd at eight in the morning, everyone is waking up, everyone's turning on their lights, everyone's taking a shower. So we're at 8.2 gigawatts of energy there. So where is the magnitude difference in, in terms of how much is being consumed in the city? And we expect that this is fairly similar in many of the cities that have heating loads like this. So a lot of the northeastern cities, definitely. Uh, it's probably different if you go down south uh, to you know, Florida or, uh, or say Arizona. So let me talk about DURCAM, which is what we used to, so we took all this data, we had all this data, we have knowledge of where all these buildings are in space, um, but we need a way to kind of collect all that data and make recommendations about where we would put a microgrid if we had to you know, invest money in microgrids. So DURCAM is, gonna, is what we use to help us with, with the decision-making. So it's Distributed Energy Resources Customer Adoption Model. It's put out by Berkeley National Lab. It's a mixed integer linear program that optimizes for a couple of things. It'll optimize for um, total energy costs or carbon dioxide, or it can do both simultaneously. Um, and it, but it, what it needs is exactly the, the information that campus provided us, which is heating, electric, hot water, and cooling. So let me just talk about some of the, 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 uh, the populated um, equipment costs that we put in. So we didn't didn't have a, an exhaustive review of every single type of, of equipment that we had that it could be put into a microgrid. We, we put in what we thought would be the most useful. So micro turbines, combustion uh, turbines, internal combustion with combined heat and power and hot water, um, and then some, some other ones here, um, including diesel, et cetera. So this just, just shows the cost of, of the equipment. Um, then we have upfront capital costs and then kind of ongoing uh, costs and for O and M and over the lifetime. So for the flow chart, this is what DURCAM is, is essentially doing. Uh, we're, we're giving it the utility and the resources, the local resources for fuel, et cetera. And we're, uh, so we're giving it all the costs for the fuel and all the costs for the electricity and, and, uh, and everything else. And then we're giving it the demand and some of the constraints. That, that we are imposing on it, and then giving it the list of technologies that we're that we're um, look want to kind of sweep those technologies for the optimization, uh, and then it'll give us the optimal planning and operations answers from that. Uh, so, like I mentioned before, we're looking at three microgrid types. Uh, today, I'll mostly talk about multi-user microgrids, but we did for the study. You can find the study on the internet. Um, the energy justice microgrids, which would be kind of affordable housing, kind of propping up the folks that were uh, are, are poor or, or elderly, um, and then emergency microgrids where people could go if there's a if there's a problem. But I'm mainly going to focus on multi-user microgrids today. These are mixed-use, high-density uh, areas that usually include an anchor building and have some critical facilities attached to them. 
So for the microgrid modeling analysis, uh, the way that we started it was we, we took the building data from campus. We tried to find anchor buildings, that is large buildings that had high loads that we could build a, a microgrid around. We then would group buildings around those anchor buildings. We would look at the thermal um, footprints for those buildings, that is looking at kind of the heating loads that they had, and that's heating in terms of both um, air and water. We would also look at some of the energy usage and some of the constraints around, uh, around the anchor building for the buildings you know, near it. We would put all of that into Durkham along with the utility costs, the regional greenhouse gas mix from the, the, the bulk grid. And then Durkham would give us what, what it thought was the kind of the baseline cost, what was happening you know, prior to an optimization, what it thought the costs were in the greenhouse greenhouse gas emissions would be for that set of buildings that we gave it for that grouping. Then it would give us the optimized version. If we were to create a microgrid that was cost optimal, what would that look like and what kind of assets would be uh, involved in that and what would they cost? And then a microgrid that was greenhouse gas optimized, what the assets looked like there and, and how they were, were, were used. From there, we could take the information that Durkham provided and, and give microgrid rankings, that is, in terms of cost, in terms of greenhouse gases, and in terms of the mission. That is, is it a multi-user microgrid? Is it an affordable housing type microgrid? Or is it a critical facilities type of microgrid? So before I go on, I just want to kind of briefly touch on what combined heat and power is. I'm going to, I think I've mentioned this in the past uh, a couple slides, but uh, combined heat and power is, you know, you see it a lot on, on campuses. Um, MIT has one, uh, I believe uh, Princeton has one. My alma mater, UMass Amherst has one. Uh, and it's essentially using the fuel twice. You use the fuel for generating electricity, but then you take that waste heat and you recover it and you can send that to steam or, or, uh, or heating loads. And so uh, some of these combined heat and power plants can be on the order of 80% efficient, whereas if you just had electricity, uh, it's usually on the order of about 40% efficient. So we're really doubling the amount of, uh, of energy that's extracted from the fuel, which is where we want to be. In terms of national security, again, we don't need to be burning fuel for no reason. You know, That would mean that we'd have to go get more, and whether that's going to the Middle East to get it or somewhere else, if there's always a national security concern if, if we're uh, wasting energy. So let me talk about some of these building groupings as I mentioned here uh, before. So the top 0.2% of the of building energy uh, use is shown here. So this is the top users of energy in the city itself. This is where we decided we, we should look at building microgrids. That is, we would pick one of these buildings, or one of these parcels of land, and then Try to determine what was near it and that we could kind of leverage for the microgrid. So Logan Airport is on there, that's the big one on the top right, but that's not the best place to run a microgrid, although you probably already have one. Um, so the multi-user microgrid uh, screening algorithm that we were looking at, again, we picked the building in the middle, that's the anchor building, and then we sized the CHP plant for 60% of the peak electric. So that is, if the peak electricity is, you know, 100 megawatts, and that only happens for, you know, five minutes a year, we're going to size the CHP plant for taking uh, 60 megawatts. That's, that's the size of it. We're going to assume that 40% 40, uh, 40 electric generation efficiency, we're going to assume a spark spread, meaning the, the amount of money that it costs for me to generate electricity versus buying electricity is actually positive. That is, it, it makes sense for someone to do this. Uh, that was actually $70 a megawatt hour uh, in Boston at this time. Uh, we're going to kind of radiate out from that, that center building in, in uh, 50 meter increments, and we're going to pull in all the buildings in those circles that you see. And we're going to uh, design the CHP plant uh, around, uh, around those buildings. So can those buildings take some of that excess heat from the CHP plant? Do they have the right heating loads or heating profiles to take the heat uh, from the electrical generation? Uh, 
Uh, and we're not selling anything back to the, the utility grid here. We could do that, but the city did not want us to look at something like that. So in terms of the building ranking now, and this, this is a plot that I, I put together that uh, shows the building ranking uh, in terms of energy size or energy use, and then the distance away from those buildings. And what we're looking for here is a thermally matched um, portfolio. That is, we can always get rid of our heat, right? It's always hard to get rid of to get rid of heat. It's easy to make electricity. Um, so we're looking for places that can take the heat. Uh, so if you kind of go through this this fire plot, it's the things that are more white that we would pinpoint as the places that we should run uh, a CHP plant. Places that are black, they have no thermally matched time. That is, there's no, never an instance where the buildings can take some of the heat from the CHP plant, some of that excess heat. And then there's everything kind of in between. So we're really pinpointing a lot of the places that, that have these white bands here that you see, places like this, so that they can take the, the heat. Let me just talk a little bit about the critical facilities and affordable housing before I move on. So this was one of the layers that the city wanted us to look at. So some of the supermarkets, pharmacies, gas stations, emergency shelters, and affordable housing are on here. <clears throat> now certainly in Hurricane Harvey uh, and, and, and other hurricanes, this is the, these are the places that people need to go. You know, people have to go get gas. And even though if there's a shortage of gas, that's a problem too. But having gas stations that are open is always a, a, a challenge, but it's great if you can do it having access to pharmacies where people can get the drugs that they need, emergency shelters and supermarkets where people can get food. So we, these are some of the other layers that we could consider if we really wanted to. Some other constraints are that there are actually in Boston uh, already <clears throat> some microgrids. So we don't want to recommend putting a microgrid where there's already a microgrid. So Harvard University has one, MIT has one, uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston has one, uh, but also the this kind of big grid in the middle here, this is the, the Veolia steam system. So it's actually already an existing steam system that can, can move heat around in, in Boston. So the question is, can we actually leverage that with, with a microgrid? The answer is unclear at the moment, but uh, that's the type of, of uh, information that you, you really wanted to know prior to recommending any microgrid. So let me just talk about some of the results from DERCAM after having all that data that I so I showed you the picture of, um, let me just go back here, this, this zone here, right, zone 118. So uh, what does that look like? So when we ran that through DERCAM, it's essentially recommending in terms of, we got cost optimization here and then CO2 optimization. It's recommending that we put in a fairly you know, large uh, CHP plant. This is in kilowatts. So um, 1,000 kilowatts, so something like a 5 megawatt um, CHP plant in terms of cost optimization. We capped the PV and the solar thermal at uh, 100 kilowatts each just because we were, you know, we had constraints for the roof, but it, it recommended the, the most it could recommend for, for both of those. Um, it really actually likes air source heat pumps. If you look at the economics of those, it's, it's essentially an, an air conditioner running backwards, so it's actually fairly good for, for heating. Um, and then it's recommending absorption chillers here also for this particular microgrid. Uh, it's in, on the right-hand side for energy storage, it's recommending some heat storage uh, and then some cold storage. For the CO2 optimization, things are a little, the story is slightly different, but not much. Uh, the CHP plant's a little smaller, the air source heat pump's a little bigger, the heat storage is a little smaller, and then there's no cold storage for that one. Uh, this is the same um, microgrid uh, 118. Uh, the base case is shown in green. So at the time, the base case, there was no on-site electricity. So that's why it's zero in the middle there. Um, and I'm moving clockwise around the annual costs. If you look at cost optimization, CO2 optimization in the base case, um, the cost optimization beats the base case, the CO2 optimization does not, but they're all fairly close. Uh, for total CO2 emissions, as you would expect, the base case is worse than, than the other two. Um, that's because we've added you know, PV storage, we've added some, uh, some new technologies to the mix to kind of reduce 
the, the energy portfolio, but it also reduces the CO2. Uh, in terms of utility fuel consumption, we're, we're using a lot more uh, fuel on site for the cost optimization. That is, we're, we're burning more natural gas uh, on site to produce electricity. Uh, the, the, CO, the CO2 optimization does not do that. In fact, it's, it's saying because the grid is, is decent, you should be buying more from the grid. Um, Off-site CO2 uh, generating, uh, you can see that the CO2 optimization is, is better than the, than the base case, but not by that much. And for electric, utility electrical consumption, uh, we are buying almost nothing from the utilities in, for the cost optimization. CO2 optimization, we're buying a little bit less than the base case. So this is just kind of giving an example of what some of those outputs are from, from DERCAM and how we can use them and what we should be looking for for an actual microgrid. Uh, so once we took kind of all the data from, from campus, put some of the constraints in place, ran the, the DERCAM program, got some of the outputs I just showed you, uh, we could kind of start to develop a map of where the best places were for putting these multi-user microgrids. Those are in red. So we picked, I believe it was 12, is that right? 12 uh, multi-user microgrids uh, in various places across the city that were kind of the best use cases that we could find. Uh, we picked some affordable housing. Uh, a lot of that is kind of in the, the Hyde Park area of Boston. And we picked some for critical facilities. These, these are emergency microgrids, those are in blue. So places that we would choose to put a microgrid that was not only affordable or reduces the greenhouse gas emissions, but also would be good for the community itself. That is, if you have a Hurricane Sandy, Harvey type event, these places would be open for business and they would stay open. And so the city was very interested in, in having places that they could explore for that. So this was just recommendations, kind of a, a pre-screening tool. The city then actually went to these, these communities and put some boots on the ground and looked for places that they could actually implement these microgrids, and they're starting to go down that path now. So some of the multi-user microgrid outputs that we get from, from these models from DERCAM kind of show that if you're interested in cost optimization, there are certainly savings that you can get, and that kind of the bigger the THP plant, the bigger the microgrid, the more savings you get. Um, in terms of CO2 optimization, it's kind of split. You're not really saving that much money on some of them, or you're losing money on, on, on some of the other ones, um, but you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. If that's more valuable to you than saving $1,000 a month, uh, or sorry, a million dollars a year, then, then, uh, then maybe you should pick that, that option. Or maybe there's some combination of the two that, you, that, that could be explored here. Uh, like I said, DERCAM does do this kind of a dual optimization. And you'd expect the dual optimization to fit somewhere in between these two kind of lines uh, for cost and CO2 optimization. Uh, we did run some of the energy justice microgrids as well. Uh, so a lot of those are essentially break even. There's actually one outlier for cost optimization. For CO2 optimization, if you're just looking at energy justice, that is the places that are, are good for the vulnerable populations, uh, for CO2 optimization, it's just, you end up losing money. Now, maybe that's what you want to do, but um, you, you can certainly do that. Um, so what, what are some of the next steps here that, that we wanted to explore? Now, this study was done a couple of years ago, so we've had kind of ongoing discussions with, with different uh, entities uh, in the country for what we should kind of do next. Uh, what we really want to do is, is integrate additional GIS information into this model. This model was really like a, a proof of concept. You know, can we actually take data from the city and, and do something useful with it, make a, a, a meaningful recommendation? But it was slightly restricted. Even the city doesn't know really where their electrical lines are, the utility lines are. Um, we don't really know what the loads are on the substation. So on the distribution level, we don't really understand not only where the physical lines are, but how much capacity they have, uh, what the substation's loads look like. We don't really know that much about the natural gas pipelines. We have some information about where they might be. Um, 
So this is an old city, Boston's old. So you go out to the, you talk to the utility folks and they don't even know where their own pipelines are sometimes. Uh, and that also includes some of these steam lines, you know, where do those, those sit? Uh, we were out in Springfield, Massachusetts and they have legacy steam systems out there that they were running in the, you know, mid 1900s. They're still sitting underground, but they're not being used. So some, there's some talk about revitalizing some of these older uh, infrastructures that we have available. Uh, and we, but the other thing that we kind of want to overlay is some of the criticality and vulnerability analysis using the GIS data. We didn't really quantify uh, how a vulnerable population would be would benefit from having a microgrid. There's no metric that we could kind of point to that says, yes, you're going to be less vulnerable by 20%. Uh, but there are some metrics that are emerging in, in, the, in academia and, and government that might start to point to that. And really what we want to do is, is kind of run a similar analysis in Boston or somewhere else that has real calibrated building data so that we know uh, have a better confidence about what we're saying. So when we recommend a microgrid, it's calibrated data, this is where you should really put a microgrid uh, and, and, uh, and we'd be right about it. So just as a summary, uh, we, we pioneered a city scale energy assessment. This has really never been done before. So this is exciting to do. Identified 22 sites with about 1.7 billion with a B uh, dollars in potential savings and then about a 25 year period. Uh, we established this framework that's applicable to any other region. So whether that's Boston or San Francisco or you know, somewhere in Germany, you can still do this, this type of analysis. But we kind of moving through the process, we, we identified some of these data needs. Uh, and, and more importantly, maybe it's the stakeholder impact. Uh, stakeholders could be the folks in government <clears throat> in the city itself, could be state uh, actors as well, but it's really the people that own the buildings or live in the buildings that you and, the, and the utilities that have to come on board and kind of rethink their, their, the way that they uh, approach energy systems. Uh, right now, most of the time, energy systems work great. They're not that expensive, but when there's, when there's a large problem, um, everything turns off. And that's really not where we want to be in terms of national security. <clears throat> so, and in doing in kind of um, talking to the stakeholders, we kind of developed these relationships with the public and, and in Boston that would really help expedite some of these projects in the future. Some of those lessons that we learned, these softer skills that we're not used to actually at, at Lincoln Lab, uh, it, it's, it would kind of push these projects forward a little bit. And we've demonstrated here, uh, while it's on paper, that microgrids are economically and envir environmentally viable in Boston and likely in, in other places as well. Um, just wanted to mention some of the partners. We, we worked with DOE uh, on this one, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, Boston Redevelopment Authority, uh, the Sustainable Design Lab at MIT, Department of Homeland Security, and then Berkeley National Lab. Uh, these are the folks that kind of worked on the project. I led the project on the, the Lincoln Lab side, uh, Travis Sheehan on the Boston Redevelopment Authority side. So if you go to the, the BRA website, I, I think they have a different name now, so I, I can, uh, maybe we can send out the, um, the new uh, website. But there are reports that were put together by the BRA and by us and, and by MIT Sustainable Design Lab that you can read through and, and see kind of some of the, the details that I glossed over a little bit. And that's, that's all I had for today. Uh, so I, I guess we'll move on to questions if, if that's the next phase of this. Uh, yes, Eric, uh, thank you. Thanks for that outstanding uh, presentation. As we shift to the question and answers, I just wanna remind the audience uh, to please submit their questions using the question pane at any time. Uh, during this, we'll keep up several links on the screen uh, for quick ref reference that point to where to find some information about upcoming and previously held webinars and how to take advantage of the Ask an Expert program. Uh, we've had some great questions from the audience so far. Uh, so I'd like to begin. Uh, Eric, is there time of use and demand charge for commercial customers applied in Boston? Uh, <clears throat> no, we did not do that. That's something that we, we want to do in the future with, with this type of, of project. Um, I think some of the subtleties on that one were that we didn't really have great access to, to some of that economic data. 
um, but we should have. You know, it's something that we um, definitely want to get our hands on. And I think since we've done this this program, the citywide energy study, we have been able to engage with uh, ISO New England and 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 uh, kind of get some of those numbers. Now, so the other piece of this that I didn't mention was that the city itself, you know, they commissioned us to do this study, but they were very wary of having um, having this look negative to the utilities. So some of the demand charges or some of the time of use charges that, that we're talking about, we did not incorporate into the model on purpose so that utilities would kind of have a softer blow, if you will, for, um, for the, the impacts of, of economic impacts. So uh, I think I think I hope that answers the question. But um, certainly there's 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 definitely more research to be had here, and it was um, kind of a proof of concept, if you will. Okay, very good. Uh, how was the differences in the electricity charge rate included in a mix of building electricity cost analysis? Yeah, so we we did have some uh, discrepancy there. So we had pricing for industrial, commercial, residential. So when we knew what types of buildings we had, so we could really break out some of those different price categories, uh, and those were all included in the model. Um, like I said, we didn't do demand charges or any time of use charges or anything like that, but we did have some level of, of fidelity on, on the pricing. Um, but then once Durkham pulled all that information in, it was able to, to uh, optimize with the numbers that we gave it. Now we could give it any other numbers too if we had more data. Okay. Um, we've had several questions from the audience about how you came up with the 60% um, for the CHP sizing and the 40% for energy efficiency. Yeah, so those are basically rules of thumb for CHP plants. So um, if you, there's not much literature on it, but if, if you kind of go to uh, some of the, the, I guess, the, the utilities that, that do this, they, those are the numbers that they actually use for their rule of thumb. And that's kind of the, what I, I'll call the pre-screening. So you really want to be able to, 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 do, uh, to, to offset some of that, that thermal and, uh, energy, but those are the numbers that we, we found people were using. Okay, very good. Um, the data that was, um, was used in the simulation um, was not validated. How did this affect the model? Yeah, so we don't really know. That's the problem. If, if you look at some of the data um, that we have, it's very robotic. That is, everyone in the city is turning on and off their lights at the same time. Um, and so that presents some interesting uh, trends, if you will, in, in the city itself. Uh, what you would expect to see in a city is that there's a distribution uh, or probability that someone's going to turn on their light at any given time, but it's not... Uh, not exactly at the same time. And so it, in terms of the energy use, it probably, um, we're probably close. In terms of the power profiles, we're, we might be close. But in terms of the kind of the hour to hour, day to day um, energy management, it's, it starts to get a little bit murkier. We're, we're probably pretty good on the monthly or yearly uh, scale, but uh, the daily to weekly scale is, is definitely different. So we really want to get the calibrated data. That was something we tried to work with the utilities to get, and we were just never successful at, at, at getting that. And some of that is, is for privacy issues. You know, you don't want to be giving uh, data away to, uh, to us, essentially, if you're the utility, because there are folks that are, I guess you can discern some, some patterns of behavior from it. So there's some sensitivity there. Okay. Um, did your analysis consider the required square footage for the equipment, PV arrays, turbines, heating systems, fuel storage, et cetera? So we assumed that it could be put in the basement of somewhere. Um, and whether that's a great assumption or not, I'm not sure. I think that if you look at some of these um, older buildings, they, they do have uh, large basements, um, but we didn't necessarily say, you know, you have to have this much square footage for a CHP plant. Uh, and, and the reason for that was that the, a lot of the CHP plants that we that we were looking at were not large. That is, um, they're, they're less than 100 megawatts. 
So we felt that in terms of square footage, we wouldn't really need that that large of a footprint um, to get the job done. Uh, I should note also um, that the city really was not interested in showing that uh, some of these CHP plants would be off-putting a lot of, uh, of CO2. So we didn't run them as hard as, as we probably could have run them, uh, um, given the footprint size that they had. But uh, I just mentioned that as an aside. So they, they, the CO2 levels that were actually coming out of them are a little bit lower than they should have been. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is, have you thought about doing this in other cities? Definitely, and we if, and we are definitely open to doing this again. Uh, we've talked to folks in San Francisco and uh, New York City uh, about doing it. We've thought about doing it locally here in, in Massachusetts again, just to get uh, have a municipal utility work with us to, to get better data. But you know, we're definitely interested in doing this somewhere. Uh, we, like I said, we kind of trailblaze a little bit here just to to understand what we didn't know and what we needed to know and, and so i think this, the second generation of the second city that we would do would we'd have a lot more institutional knowledge of, of how to get this done what kind of impacts it would have in terms of the community and and uh, and really national security uh, and, and as you can see microgrid in the last couple of years microgrids have been uh, discussed more and more and more we had some symposiums uh here at the lab on microgrids. Uh, and so we're getting more and more engagement there. We're definitely engaged with uh, other universities around the nation just to, to kind of push microgrids. We're engaged with, uh, with microgrids uh, for tactical spaces, whether that's Afghanistan, Iraq, or DOD bases. So there's a lot of involvement from Lincoln Laboratory in, in microgrids, and this is just one of those, one of those pieces that we really want to to, to grow. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question from the audience is, does the CO2 optimization model include any types of federal or local incentives for renewable energy or just the cost of local marginal price? Local marginal price. So we didn't put any, we kind of stopped there. And that's probably one of the criticisms is that we, we didn't take into account the cost of the carbon dioxide. So um, I think the Boston Redevelopment Authority, they took our numbers that we gave them, the raw data, and they were the ones that actually put the, num the economics down onto those numbers. So what we, what we tried to do is stay kind of neutral and just say, this is how much we think we can reduce the energy or the CO2 just based on the, the equipment, not necessarily on anything else. Uh, and the costs were energy costs, and the and capital costs for the equipment. And then the city could then take the, those numbers uh, in terms of how much you know, CO2 reduction you, we had and add their own kind of metrics on top of that. And so if you go to the reports that, that they issued uh, for the, the community energy study, you'll see the calculus that they had for that. Uh, John Lee was the one in the economics department for the Boston Redevelopment Authority that started to put some of these numbers together. Uh, and so when you look at kind of the social impacts or the climate impacts, uh, et cetera, for the CO2, it actually turned out to be fairly significant that if you're saving CO2, uh, you know, how much money the city is, is saving. And I forget the numbers now. It's been a couple of years since I read those reports, but there's, you know, billions and billions of dollars that were being saved uh, in terms of uh, CO2. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, were there any other technologies considered besides um, CHP? Um, and if you could further um, go into about how other options were weighed for comparison? Yeah, so we did put a, so it has a giant, uh, Dirk came as a database of, of, you know, probably in terms of the bulk power grid, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 options. So it has fuel cells in there, it has uh, micro turbines, diesel gensets, internal combustion engines. Uh, it had, we put solar PV, we had, uh, we didn't, I think we had geothermal as a possibility. Um, and so we didn't really restrict what it, what it could do. It just turned out that CHP was, was kind of a, a winner. 
And there's some good reasons for that, I would say. Um, like I said, it's 80% efficient and natural gas prices are at the time were fairly low and I think they're still low, so all of the fracking. And we could go into you know, how far down the rabbit hole we want to go in, in terms of water use for fracking or where the natural gas is coming from, but we did not do that. Um, we, we tried to keep it um, fairly technology agnostic. That is, we put the, what we thought the costs were for the different equipment, keep all the equipment in there, and then just let Durcam tell us what the, the best solution was given the, the database. So it, it, it does have um, solar PV, solar thermal, batteries were in there, uh, cooling storage, et cetera. Um, but if, if you're at the city of Boston, um, putting solar, for example, on the top of some of these high rises, it's just a kind of a mismatch in terms of the geometry. It's true that you can produce electrical power uh, on top of the Prudential Center, for example, at, at, you know, on the 100th floor, but relative to the Prudential Center, uh, which uses somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 megawatts, you're probably only going to get you know, maybe a couple hundred kilowatts out of it. Uh, and so, um, and there's also shading issues in, in major cities. So PV uh, was, was an option, but it was not the best option. Um, so I, I think that answers the question. And, but I'll again give a plug to, uh, to MapDwell. If you're interested in solar power, check out MapDwell.com, M-A-P-D-W-E-L-L.com. And that'll show you some of what uh, the data was that we put in for, for PV panels. Okay, thank you, Eric. Our next question was, was there any consideration for outage, natural disaster, um, and island, actual island operation time? So not really for this study. Uh, we have other programs at the lab that consider that type of thing. For this, we're, we're basically assuming 100% uptime. That is, if you have a microgrid, uh, you know, first of all, where would you put the microgrid? And that's kind of what this analysis was. Uh, we we did look at the floodplain a little bit, you know, if this is going to get flooded or not, and do we want to put a, a CHP plant or, you know, substation where it's flooding? Definitely not. So there were some layers there that, that we kind of screened by hand, um, but we didn't have anything like, like outages or anything like that uh, in, in the model. That's kind of, this is the pre-screen model, any kind of pick the candidates that, you know, 22 candidates that we, that we had here, and then you kind of do different analysis after that. Uh, some, of, some of them got screened out just because of floodplain issues or other issues. Thank you. Um, the next question is, is a microgrid control standard needed for better standardizing microgrid designs? Yes, and we're working on, well, we're working on a tactical microgrid standard here at the lab, uh, tactical microgrids being uh, anything that's kind of the DOD uses, I guess. Um, in general, I think IEEE is looking at that, uh, and we are on some of the working groups. I'm not involved in that, as uh, my, uh, some of my colleagues are. Uh, Eric Limpocker uh, is probably the first and foremost person here at the lab that's, that's pushing for these standards. So. What you don't want is to have a lot of different microgrids that are uh, that have different control systems and different control algorithms. Uh, and in terms of bulk utility grid, you really want everyone to, when they close the contactor to to re-energize or to, to reconnect with the grid, everyone's on the same frequency. The voltages are kind of you know everything's sorted out. Uh, you don't want any problems uh, when you reconnect. And that's some of that is is black starting. Um, basically a, a part of the grid. So we're looking at, at doing some black start analysis with microgrids right now. So how would you take, say, disparate microgrids in the city of Boston and actually connect them together? Uh, what kind of standards do you need to do that? What kind of controls do you need to do that? We have a, an adjacent program here at the lab called the Hardware in the Loop program that we actually take simulated um, microgrids in, in Simulink or MATLAB and we hook them up to real hardware controllers, uh, Woodward controllers that, that would that think they're controlling a real microgrid. And we basically run the simulation and have the, the controller uh, control it. And so there's actually some interesting dynamics that happen there when you've got lots of different controllers and, and lots of, of, of different options. 
you don't want emergent behavior from, from some of these controllers. So how, how do you manage the, uh, the standards there to make sure that there's no, none of this emergent behavior, make sure that the frequency and the voltages are all set before, before the contactors are closing? Thank you, Eric. Um, for our final question of the webinar, did you explore smart grid style microgrids um, and also a central grid microgrid controller will supervisedly control over the lighting, heating plugs, loads, et cetera? Um, what was the first part of that? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me Are repeat it. Do you, um, did you explore smart grid style microgrids? Smart grid, uh, I guess I'm not sure what that means per se, but no, there was no okay. smart grid, I guess, uh, infrastructure embedded here. Uh, we have talked to campus about doing something like that, which I think is the second part of your question. Uh, the microgrid controller that we were kind of thinking of for this study did not control lighting, did not control the buildings. That would be the second layer that we want to add on to it uh, in kind of a, an adjacent study. If you took uh, one of these microgrid areas and then you had building controllers that could turn on and off uh, air conditioning, cooling, uh, or lighting, etc. You could really uh, start to change some of those load profiles that I that I showed and uh, change some of the demands and then have the microgrid controller interact with that controller. So that's kind of you know, double controlling it. But I think there's definitely benefits there, and certainly the macro grid does something like that, where they're doing um, uh, demand control. So they'll turn off, well, you know, they'll have different buildings or different entities sign up to turn off when when there's high high demand. Prisons will turn off, or municipal buildings can turn their their loads off, and that'll just manage the grid a little bit. Uh, we could definitely do that in some of these buildings. We're definitely interested in in having kind of this dual control use where we control the building and then control the microgrid and, and iterate. Uh, we have not done that yet, but we're definitely thinking about doing that. Thank you, Eric, for the um, informative question and answer session. For any of the questions we didn't get to, and we got a lot of great questions today, um, we'll connect with those attendees offline after the webinar. Now I just like um, to give Eric an opportunity to provide any additional or closing remarks before we end the webinar today. Uh, Eric, would you like to wrap us up? Sure, yes, just thank you everyone for, for, for being here today. And um, I assume my email address will be available. If you have any questions for me directly, uh, just, just please contact me. Uh, like I said, the lab is, is very engaged in this area right now. And so we're interested in, in partnering with uh, you know, utilities, commercial entities, et cetera, uh, other, um, other laboratories around the, the country to kind of push some of this technology forward. So thank you very much and, uh, and have a nice day, everyone. Great, thank you again, Eric. On behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a thank you to Eric and all our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We are very much appreciate your time and hope in return that you had some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solution Center resources and services, including no-cost support through our Ask an Expert service. I invite you to check the Solution Center website if you'd like to view the slides and listen to, to the recording of today's presentation, uh, as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you'll find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We are also now posting the webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Please allow about a week for the audio recording to be posted. Finally, I'd like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear when we conclude the webinar. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar.